Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to today's uh, first maiden voyage um, chat around the world. Um, it's an absolute pleasure um, for me to be here today with this amazing and inspiring group of ladies. I feel very lucky to know them and I feel very lucky to be talking about um, business travel to the Middle East uh, today. So um, just um, a bit of housekeeping. We are recording the session. Um, so hopefully that's okay. If you, um, you won't be visible um, whilst we're recording, but if you have any questions, which I hope you do, please feel free to drop these into the Q&A box um, as we go along. Um, but before we get started, it would just be good if I can do a quick sound check, if you could just drop a, a message in the chat box to let me know that you can see us and you can hear us all. Um, and whilst I'm doing that, I'm going to go through the panel today um, and introduce everybody um, and try not to cry because I just think I feel so emotional and um, that I'm missing business travel so much. And I don't know, when I sort of put this, this slide together and listened to the music, I felt really sad that we can't travel. So hopefully today it will be a virtual trip around the Middle East. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Anna to us. Anna, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Anna. Uh, I've been in Dubai now for 16 years in uh, May. So time goes by very fast when you're living in the region. Uh, I'm originally from Portugal. Um, I work in marketing and currently I'm taking care of ASICS, uh, the sports brand for the Middle East. Thank you, Anna. Um, and Aurelie? Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Aurelie. I am French. Uh, so I work in travel, business travel, and I'm a world traveler myself, a digital nomad since the past seven years. Um, so 2020, I was pretty much grounded, <laughs> like everyone, right? Uh, and I came to Dubai last October, uh, like initially to visit some friends. It was supposed to be 12 days. Um, I'm still here. So because I decided to extend. Um, so really excited, really excited to now be in the Middle East and really see another face of, you know, Dubai, I would say. Really, really a dif different way to work and travel. Really interesting. So really looking forward to talking about that today with this bunch of great ladies. <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. Thanks, Carolyn. So I'm Victoria. I run a business called Balls Global. We help um, British, European, and actually now started with American businesses actually to internationalize. So that will be anything related to market access. Um, we have more, we've had a focus on the Middle East for quite some time now. And I think given the scenario in Europe with what's happening, there's only going to become more and more focus on the region. I normally, I was just saying to Carolyn before this started, you know, this time last year, I was out doing my usual kind of quarterly visits that I tend to do in the region. So that's usually UAE, but not just the UAE, but also Saudi Arabia, where I've put quite a lot of focus over the last 12 to 18 months, which is a really interesting um, opportunity for, for certainly the businesses in the sector I, I work within and, and certainly others as well. Uh, Kuwait, in fact, and just before this call, I was on, on the phone to a retailer in Qatar as well. And that's obviously quite an interesting part of the world now that's that's opening up again um following obviously what happened towards the end of last year with with relations in the in the gulf so yeah i'm, I'm really excited to kind of like you say rem reminisce to some extent because it's been it's been a long time since i was back out there a year ago and um also just hear what everybody else on the panel has to say about and share their experiences also thank you victoria and amanda i'll come to you next Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Amanda. I run an organisation called the Training, Gate Training Gateway, which helps British education and training suppliers find opportunities overseas. And I guess my main two markets are Southeast Asia and the Middle East. Um, so I would normally go out there at least once a year, if not more. Um, I've been to, I think every country in the Middle, Middle East, love them all, they are all so different. Um, really enjoy it, really enjoy that opportunity to go and understand a little bit more about business cultures and just the way that we can work in partnership with people across the world. Um, definitely missing the travel. Um, I guess on the positive side, it has meant 
we've had many more virtual types of things happening between the Middle East and the UK, which has been great. But personally, I'd far rather be getting on a plane and going out to see people than doing, doing all the business over, over Zoom. Um, but I think going forwards, it'll probably be a bit of a blend of both. I think there'll be more, more enthusiasm for doing some online stuff as well as those face-to-face -face visits. But yeah, like, like everybody else, looking forward to a bit of reminiscing, but also thinking about what we can do there in the future. Superb, thank you very much, Amanda. And we'll come to Saida next. Hi, Caroline. Um, so I'm Saida Ahmed. I run an education related business which provides education solutions, but also I'm involved in a number of non-exec roles and advisory roles, which are around um, sustainable cities, healthcare solutions, environmental solutions that are about creating a world post COVID-19. So um, for, for myself, I was, um, my last visit was actually to Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia before the lockdown. So then after that, I think that I had so many trips that just either got postponed or canceled altogether. And I think that the Gulf is a really interesting part of the world and you can't actually talk about it and as, as from textbooks, it's something that you have to experience and notice the differences from country to country. And, and also, I think as a, as a British Muslim woman, I, it's very much, you know, how I can go to a country and pick up different things than say some of my um, mainstream British colleagues and friends would so we pick up on different things and we and, and 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 how that actually both helps me but at times actually creates great laughter because of people presuming that I'm actually from the region itself. Thank you very much Saida um, and um, you it may not have escaped your notice that we have an all-female panel today um, quite rare I have to say in business um, so whilst um, actually Anna and Amanda are both uh, Maiden Voyage ambassadors, um, you know, we will be touching on some of the things that specifically impact female travellers, but I know we've got some men um, on, the, uh, on the attendee list, so feel free to ask your questions as well. Um, so I'm going to get started really by asking um, you, Victoria, as um, Asaid has referred to you as a mainstream British um, businesswoman, um, what have been some of the um, interesting um, cultural challenges that you've encountered? And can you talk a little bit about the regions that you encountered them? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I think if we touch upon Saudi, is that tends to be the one where I think there's a lot more. Um, to some extent, if, if you're a, a particular female business traveler, there may be a bit more kind of stereotypical presumptions around how the market is, how you will be treated within the marketplace, um, how to get around. And I have to say that, you know, it's changed so much over the past few years. I mean, I've been going quite regularly for the last 18 months and the changes just from one trip to another within literally a matter of months has been really kind of astounding. But in a positive way, I have... I found, and I, and I don't know, I mean, I remember with Saida, we had a, we, we, we a couple, probably a couple of years ago now, we did do an interview um, and we discussed about the difference of being Muslim and non-Muslim within, as if, and particularly as a female. And I found that I've never had a problem doing business in the region as, as, as I am a British non-Muslim female solo traveler, that I've always been able to speak to the people I've wanted to speak to, have the business meetings, I've been treated with respect, I've been given the time at quite senior level within organisations to access the right people because hierarchy is obviously quite a key, a key thing to bear in mind across the region and obviously make sure you're dealing with the right people at the right level to be able to, in my case, um, obviously sell to the sell to that region often be able to build the relationships, it has to be at the right level and I've never had a problem. I mean people say well you know, and I've had that, I guess, when I am working with clients or engaging with my services, people sometimes often question, well, are you able to do business as a woman, particularly in Saudi Arabia? And, and it's been, well, actually, yes. I mean, obviously, I don't know if anybody's turned down a business meeting on the basis of, of my gender or, or guess where I'm originating from, but I've certainly found 
if more so than not actually a bit more intrigue maybe and, and actually it's maybe been a positive thing that it's allowed me to open up doors certainly if I think about some of the conversations I can I can have and the type of people and in organizations that I can engage with in in the market in say Saudi I wonder if on the UK side, for example, would I be able to do that quite as easily? Would I have as much um, opportunity? I feel like it's a privilege to work across the region where I can, um, you know, gain that, that, that basis of relationship, gain the trust of those people and actually do great business in the region. And I, I love it on that basis. And, you know, when I go out and have meetings, it's not always just about um, the transactional side. They always want to get to know you as an individual first and foremost. And you have to be able to put that aside in terms of the business objectives that you have and be able to engage with those people as individuals as well, often obviously very, very male dominated, but, I've found that I've been able to do great business and continue to build those relationships in a really, really positive way. So it hasn't ever impacted me. And if anything, it, like I say, it's probably given me in some ways a bit of a, a bit of an edge because, you know, I am female. I am a bit different. I'm, 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 if you think stereotypically, again, the types of international managers or export managers, they can be obviously often quite old because they're very kind of experienced in what they do so I'm I'm kind of coming with something a little bit different that you know even if initially it's about raising a bit of intrigue and a bit of curiosity once I can put across that I am professional I'm educated I'm here and I'm serious then you know that's always put me in really good stead. That's great so it's actually the novelty value you think maybe that's been a bit of a door opener um, for you. Yeah, and I and I will take that on the basis yeah. that you know I will then put myself across as who I am and what I offer, and it's 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 held me in good stead as a result. I would say so, definitely. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Amanda, I'm going to come to you. Um, can you talk to us about the mechanics of women traveling solo to the Middle East? So, the, I think you know I I came across a number of years ago a lady who worked for the Department of International Trade and. I think she'd had quite um, a challenging experience um, in terms of who she was traveling with. And I think she was temporarily locked up. So could you explain what we need to do and also dispel any myths um, which might be blocking women from traveling to the region? Excellent. Well, I've never been locked up, so, uh, so that's good. And uh, I, I suspect that is very, very rare. Um, I think from my perspective, it's, it's about being culturally sensitive so, I mean, and across the region, it's, it's very different. So in Dubai, when you're out socially, then what a woman wears is not as restrictive as possibly it is in, in Saudi. But still for a business meeting, you, th there are expectations. So I think it's about making sure that you wear, wear the right clothes and present yourself as a professional person. Um, rather than as a woman, if that, if that makes sense. So I think um, I did have to get clo new clothes for my, for my wardrobe, without a doubt. Um, I tend to wear things with short, short sleeves, actually long sleeves, um, dresses below the knee, that sort of thing. So I think in terms of that, the practicalities are making sure that you're culturally aware. So, so read the books, um, speak to people who are there saying, well, what's appropriate for me to, to wear? Um, how is it appropriate for me to shake hands with somebody? Um, should I be expecting a man to shake hands with me? Should I expect to be able to shake hands with a man, woman, etc.? So I think it's being culturally sensitive and doing your homework before you go, because each, each country, it's the same in Europe. Um, we have different ways of greeting people. I, I was always amazed in, in France, where actually you get a kiss when you go into, in, into a meeting. It's like, oh my goodness, didn't expect that. Um, where is that? I mean, that, that wouldn't necessarily happen in the middle of Saudi, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but every place has a different way of doing things. We do things in a very British way, which we don't think anything of because that's just how we conduct business. So I think speak to people. Events like this are great because you can ask a specific question. If I'm going to country X for a meeting, what, what should I wear? How should I behave? What sort of things should I take? Is it gift giving? All sorts of different nuances between different cultures. So, uh, so it's really do your homework. And in terms of, um, you know, women, um, uh, you know, taking a taxi with a male driver, could you explain, you know, if anybody's got any reservations about that? 
Yes, I mean, I think the the only time where I've seen that as being an issue has been in Saudi, but I haven't been to Saudi for over 18 months now, and I think that has significantly changed. But what you may still find is that some women in Saudi are not still not happy to have a, to take a taxi with a male driver. Um, they may have their own male driver who they would use, but they may not be happy to go in an, in an open taxi with with themselves with a, with a different with a man who that wasn't part of their family or a kind of an employee. Um, so I've, I've never had any problems. I do use all the apps. So in each country, there's rather, rather like we have, um, I can't remember, the, the, it's so long since I've been to London, the app for taxis in London, whatever that is, they have similar apps in other countries. Um, so I would always use that because it's tracked. You know the name of the car, the name of the driver, um you can locate them on the map as to where they are etc you can tell somebody look i'm being picked up in this car etc etc so just for general safety thing i think using an app is uh, to book your taxes is really useful or many places um, the company will book you a driver and things like that again arriving at an airport it's always useful to get the hotel or your host to say pick me up please um, rather than just relying on an open taxi when you go out of an airport. But that's the same anywhere. I wouldn't necessarily come off the plane in Heathrow and jump in a taxi because I wouldn't have a clue how much I was going to be charged and uh -huh. anything. So, again, it's just common sense. Uh -huh. Yeah, in fact, I think I was semi-kidnapped in Paris once by <laughs> getting into the wrong car. <laughs> so it can happen anywhere. Um, just before um, I sort of move on... Um, no, actually, I will come back to you because I want to just pick up on something that you said um, for Aurelie and for Anna regarding Dubai. So we talked about a more relaxed dress code um, in Dubai. Um, and obviously, it's a more liberal um, society. But there are some um, comparisons of perception versus reality. Um, and, we, and we see a big disparity, don't we, between people who go on holiday and you know, don't understand the dress code versus people who maybe go on business and are slightly more conservative. Or really, what's your observations been whilst well, you've been there? So, um, yeah, I would echo what you just said. You see clearly that there's a, there's some sort of a gap with people thinking they're on holidays and, you know, just wearing very, very casual clothes like we would typically wear them on a, you know, everywhere in Europe or, or somewhere else, which, which might be slightly offensive, to be honest, towards, towards locals. Um, so uh, I would say, you know, the first tip is just simply to be mindful. Um, again, li like Amanda said, just, just do your homework. Um, look a bit around. I mean, it's perfectly fine. Um, you know, on, on the beach, and this is what I really love in Dubai, it's that you, you, you will have three, four, five completely different styles of women uh, next to each other uh, in a mall uh, on the beach, and there, there won't be any problem. Uh, there, there's this, this tolerance that it's very rare to find this uh, anywhere else in the world. Um, but, but to my point, yeah, be, be mindful. Just like on the beach, it's okay, but then uh, just just don't go w walk in the street wearing uh, just you know two layers of clothes, and and because this 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 does not sound appropriate. But again, maybe maybe it's it's common sense, like we just discussed. Here, it's I would say it's a bit more sensitive because of the local culture, and you don't want to come across disrespectful because after all, you're not a native, you're not a local. Um, and you, you're, you're a visitor, so you need, you need to respect that. Uh, personally, I had zero issue um, so far, but, but, but again, uh, I always observe uh, around me and, uh, and I look around, especially when, when I don't know the culture. And here in Dubai, it's a bit different because everybody speaks English, right? You might not come across that language barrier that you could find in different countries in, in, uh, in, mid, in the Middle East. I mean, I had that in China when I was there 10 years ago, like you could literally not communicate with people <laughs> around you, right? And uh, even, even 12 years ago, so there was no iPhone, this, is not, this was not a thing at all. You couldn't look, look, look up things online or, or you know, order a cab. Um, but, but yeah, uh, Anna, I don't want to, uh, I, don't, I, I don't want to steal, steal, steal the show for you. So <laughs> I'll let you share your take on that. 
if you have two perspectives, right, of someone who lives here and someone that comes to visit or that is staying here temporarily, but you were spot on. I mean, things have changed quite a lot. And, and funny enough, I did choose to wear something a little bit more open today to show exactly that, that it's okay to wear what you feel comfortable with. And, and I think like you were saying, it's about being mindful of what are your circumstances. If I'm going to a brunch with a bunch of friends in a hotel by the pool, I'm not going to be wearing the same thing that if I'm going to be in a mall where I'm going to be exposed with a completely different type of or different people. And it is the same thing on the business environment. I will not wear a, bit, a, a dress like this for a business meeting, even if I was in Portugal or even if I was in the UK. So I think it's, it's really about understanding the settings and understanding the people that you're going to be meeting and being responsible and being mindful. and. The, the key point I believe is that you have the freedom to wear whatever you want to, but it is your decision to be respectful of the freedom that you have. And, and that's, I think, what everyone really appreciates here in Dubai. And talking a little bit of Saudi, because obviously things have changed a lot in Saudi. And I was in Saudi just before the lockdown. I was in Kuwait just before the lockdown as well. And I've been going to Saudi for the past 10 years. Uh, and my first time in Saudi, I was literally covered head to toe, super scared because I was afraid some of my hair would show and the police would come and arrest me because I'd had similar stories from friends that things like this had happened. And last time I went to Saudi, I was walking around with no abaya, just sitting down in a coffee shop while I saw all these other Saudi men and women socializing in a coffee shop before my colleagues used to beg me to come to Saudi because that was their only alternative into getting into a restaurant because most of the restaurants were split between families and bachelors and some of the nicer restaurants did not have bachelor section so only as a family could you go into the nicer restaurants so they were always looking forward to having me around because that meant that we could go to all the best restaurants because we could pretend we were a family uh, and obviously now that is not there. There is concerts going on. There's like a huge drive for socialization, which wasn't there before. And it's really palpable. Like you are walking on the streets and you can see the difference. And, uh, and obviously we all come to this at different angles. And obviously you need to see the evolution of the evolution of the country to be able to understand it. But 10 years ago, it, it felt a bit, especially for a white Westerner, it felt a, a little bit scary right like you were walking on the street and you were literally worried that the police might come and um and have a go at you because you were walking with a man that was not your husband or your brother um but but that's really has changed quite a lot and uh and once again within the business community a lot of things have changed as well and um and yeah it's, it's all very positive and it's all very reassuring in a way that uh, that it just means that cultures are coming together more and more Ah, thank you. But, but to, to your point, Anna, I mean, I had some comments that made me smile, like, you know, cliches and people thinking about, oh, but you're in Dubai now. Do you need, do you need to wear, you know, the abaya? Do you, and people are scared, but in general, it's, it's just people are scared of what they don't know, right? Yeah. So we, we also, I think, must educate and, and be a bit more vocal uh, on, you know, this experience and how things are changing and, and getting people to feel more comfortable and, yeah. and, and simply like, do you, again, be mindful, be respectful, do you, and nothing's bad is going to happen. <laughs> I remember when I moved here, literally, and, and I can hear my mom's words back then, right? I moved here with like full sleeves, winter yeah. clothes almost because that's what you could find with, with such a coverage. And then I arrived to Dubai and I'm like, what am I going to do with these clothes? Because it's summer and everyone is just wearing crop tops and bikinis at the beach and wearing some nice dresses and all I have is winter clothes. <laughs> so, and this was already 10 years or 16 years ago, actually. So, um, so it's always been a very open society and very respectful of the different cultures. And, and I think that's one of the reasons we all love being here is exactly because of that. Now you are making me travel sick. Um, mm -hmm. Saida, I'm going to come on to you. Um, could you talk to us a little bit around um, traditional dress for the region? And Because I think sometimes when people are traveling that, um, 
you know, they, they don't know what they have to wear, what it's all called. And I think, I know between yourself, Victoria, and Amanda, I think there's been some lawn of some garments going on. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. They are, I, have, I have some of Saida's headscarves and Abaya's and Amanda as well. And I still use them. I still use them when I go to... Uh, to I, I, I don't remember, you know, it's like loading out books. <laughs> You don't know where they quite actually end up. So I, at least I know that some of, some of my wardrobe is spread out. This is it, definitely. I mean, I have to I have a funny story um, because I think that one of the things is, is that people look at Muslim women from the Middle East or even part of the Muslim world and they think that they dress all the same. And actually they don't. Like, you know, you can, and, and I didn't know this. So the first time I'd gone to the Gulf on a business trip, it was one of my friends over there that told me that actually based on the styles of the abayas or even the men and, you know, the, the head covering that the men wear, you can actually guess from the style of it from which country they're from. So they have certain styles and ways and rankings and all of these. So now I was totally oblivious to it. So I went as, as an Asian Muslim. When you cover up, you just cover up. You don't actually have a, a, a sort of etiquette for how, how you cover up. You just think, oh, well, you cover up and that's it. You wear a long skirt, baggy trousers, top with long sleeves and that's it. So I went to Saudi Arabia and I went with one or two buyers that I bought from here. But really, I'd wear a suit in the UK. So I was in the hotel. So for one or two of the days, I'd worn my abaya. And then on the third day, I didn't. So the lady said to me, the Saudi lady said, you've worn an abaya for the first few days because you haven't got your abaya on. I said, yes, because it doesn't match with these clothes I'm wearing. And she burst into laughter. But what I didn't realize is that actually when I was gonna go outside, the, there would be an issue about not wearing an abaya at that time. I, I'm going into two, I'm talking about 2007. So we're talking about 13, 14 years ago. So actually there's a big difference in what's considered as okay or not okay. Now, the, the thing is, is that I think people make allowances for people who are not Muslim. So, you know, they, they, they're respectful, but it's about where you go and openly disrespect somebody. So make a comment, which is kind of either um, insulting towards the... Um, in, insulting towards the local people or condescending towards them and I've seen that where I've been on trips with people where they've gone with a mindset like we're better than you and you're not you know you, you don't know quite you are as a local woman might not know English just because she's wearing an abaya or a hijab and making assumptions that people are less intelligent or less um, uh, less educated and and I, I can still remember uh, when we were going at that time it was not department of international trade but it was UKTI and, and and we were told and it was so good that we were told they said that you know be be mindful they'll probably know more about what's going on whichever country you're going to the locals will know more about what's going on in your country than you know what's going on over there and I, I remember that when we went some of the people got asked about the performance of the football team that wasn't that well known and it, it took some of the Brits back a bit like how do they know about what's going on with I don't know Bolton for, <laughs> and, and so forth so it's it's that type of thing the other thing is is that I think as dress codes go um, generally I think that there's a loosening of you know requirements across the region uh, anyway but I think that it's it, it, it's more about being aware of what the tradition is, even if those people allow breakages from tradition. Like for me, I've been invited into people's homes. I've been invited, and, and you know, hospitality is a very big part of, 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 of the culture of the region and, and this, the generosity you will see in people. So it's about, it's about giving that reciprocal reciprocating that respect and care back so dress sense is one thing and also when we go into some of these countries 
It's about understanding that dressing, body language, how people interact with you, they're responding to, to their cultural identity, which that they won't shake hands with you, for example, necessarily out of respect, because in their local culture, it's not respectful to, to shake hands with people and so forth. So I think that there's, um, that, that there's, understandings and seeing the context to the understanding of why people expect behavior or expect certain things and and, and more than anything i think the dressing part mm. has always been seen as a respect mm. thing but with time i'm sorry has the reception mm. gone no 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 you're still mm. here you're still here right okay mm. so i think with the uh, with the dressing it's been more about mm. being seen as equals and someone that's others. I, I don't think that I've um, I've found any any disrespect in that way. What you will find though is there's big regional dif differences, and and say for example, some of the people from the MENA region, some of the people say for example from Lebanon, or from some of the other Arab. Arabic speaking countries may dress very differently to what you would uh, what you would expect. I remember I was in Bahrain and at that time a girl turned up, a Muslim girl turned up in a miniskirt and she said, oh, I'm going to my pilgrimage tomorrow. And you know, I can remember the jaws of, of us Brits and even as a Muslim woman, my jaw just dropped because you make assumptions that somebody who's dressed in a certain way is more religious or less religious or conservative or non-conservative and actually that doesn't it, it, it doesn't work in the gulf it's it, you, you would be surprised at how people come across and how their cultural or how how conservative they may be in terms of their values so no assumptions <laughs> thank you and just to touch on the fact that you said that um, they're very um, hospitable uh, what is the gifting etiquette um, in the middle east Right. This is something that I found where my friend normally when she goes and visits somewhere, she'll normally take a gift, etc. Uh, you know, something small or something that just as, as a way of sort of saying that I've thought of you and you, you take something but I don't think you know we don't have that expectation um put on us as people who are foreigners in a way but their local tradition is is that say my friend whenever she's coming back it's like a Santa's visit I mean I literally get bags of everything from food to clothes to perfumes etc so I think when allowances are made for us because we're not locals but there's also you know like I mean, I still don't get the etiquette, you know, the, the, that when, when women meet with women, and I think that it's going to be different post COVID-19, but, you know, um, they, they would kiss each other. So sometimes it's like a hug and then two kisses and a, a kiss on the other side or three kisses and then another. So, so there's all these differences from country to country, but, but men and women wouldn't be expected to do that. It would be women that kiss women uh, and shake hands and so forth and vice versa with men. So... Wonderful, thank you. Um, just a reminder to everybody, if you've got any questions for this amazing group of ladies, then feel free to, to pop these in. Um, I'm gonna come back to um, Anna and Aurelie um, to ask the question that's probably on a lot of people's lips and I've certainly heard it asked before. And that is, um, I'm a businessman or a businesswoman and I want to bring my partner of the opposite sex on a business trip with me, um, but we're not married. So the question um, is, am I allowed to share a hotel room with somebody that I'm not married to in Dubai? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, very, very, very good question, because I think that's in a lot of minds of expats when they move here as well. So yeah. when I came here, the, the rule was indeed that, and the legal law has stayed like that until today. So officially, if you are not married, you should not be sharing any kind of accommodation, being in a house, an apartment, or a hotel room, because you are not uh, legally married. Having said that, for the last 15 years, I've never heard one single time in which that rule got imposed on anyone being 
married, not married, brother, sister, whatsoever. No one has ever got any questions for anyone that was sharing accommodation in any sense. And actually last year they've announced publicly from the government that that law is going to change. So it hasn't been published into law as well because a lot of people got confused with that announcement. So the announcement is that the law is going to pass and it's going to become a federal law, but it's not passed as yet. But the law does mean that right now you could share your apartment or stay in a hotel without being married and that would be no problem whatsoever. Uh, another funny story also related to kind of similar laws is that if you are not having an alcohol license, you're not allowed to drink. So until last year as well, when they announced these rules changing, the official law was if I was an expat and if I was a tourist, I could drink whatever I want in whatever bar or club. But if I was a resident, I would only be allowed to drink even in a bar or in a club if I had the alcohol license. I've been here once again for 16 years. I never heard of anyone that got into trouble or was asked for an ID or that license at any hotel or bar. So there was a lot of things and there are a lot of things that were older rules that somehow have been uh, completely accepted as mainstream um, social life and not really imposed on anyone. So, so yes, answering that question, you can stay with whom you ever you want from whatever sex you want with, and there will be no problems. Actually, uh, I agree with, with, sorry. No, go, uh, for, uh, go, go for it already. I agree with you, Anna. I think it's also a difference whether you're a resident or a visitor. If you're here temporarily, what's like, I mean, as soon as you have, as soon as you're a resident, like you have a, an Emirates ID, I think they tend to and force it a little bit more. Like any expats I know here, I have friends who, who've been working here for years, they're all married. They, they live together, they're couples, but they're all married. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it makes it easier. But as a visitor, uh, like I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a furnished apartment right now. Uh, and uh, it's very funny because there's this, there's this uh, cliche that you know, women are not necessarily single or whatsoever so I have some funny stories um you know or if you want to get to to, to have to, to get something out of someone if you're in trouble whatever middle east culture it's face to face you will never sort anything on the phone never uh, so you go there you just say i'm gonna call my husband and this works every time <laughs> <laughs> even if you're single trust me just threaten them to call your husband and to have your husband coming and this is gonna work and same as um, I've been going to the gym, but it was a bit far and I, I was on a taxi, you know, with my, in my uh, workout outfit and the taxi driver was like, uh, why isn't your husband taking you to, to the gym? I don't understand. Why does he let a, a, a single woman, a solo woman just going there? So I made a joke out of it and I said, you know what? He's working. He's earning the money that, that I'm going to spend. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's, um, I had that a lot uh, since November because they're, they're less used to women, you know, independent, like, you know, and I'm, I'm a very, I, I'm a, I mean, I'm a fierce independent uh, solo traveler woman, but I, I get by with it using humor and yeah. same when, when you're just buying, you know, a pack of water, they say, but what, why isn't your husband helping? Is it okay for you? Can you carry the water? I say, yep, no problem. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, it's always that perception. And, and I think this is cultural that a woman uh, is with her husband or the husband helping out, uh, you know, his wife for like, things if like I, that. If I may say so, I think if you would be in Portugal, Portuguese men would make exactly the same comments. So ah, okay. that, <laughs> you don't feel such a difference <laughs> because it's just, uh, I think in general, our cultural is very much attached to the fact that the, lonely woman needs some help with the shopping and cannot be alone because she's yeah, not yeah that so doesn't work with me but yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know it's not it's not necessarily that the woman needs help with the shopping it's like how can that man be disrespecting her so much to expect her to because i think it's a perception mm. you know we we can see it in a certain thing that that, that the, not that the woman is weak but actually why should she be carrying those bags and i think these are some of the sort of nuanced differences in understanding that it's like I look at it I have certain expectations from the males in my family but when I'm 
outside. I don't have those expectations. It's like, you know what? You pick your bag at the suitcase, your suitcases, your bags at the airport and you carry your own load. But when I'm in a Muslim culture or in an Eastern culture, because it's not just Muslim, it's actually Eastern cultures, the Middle East, Asia, um, you know, parts of uh, Southeast Asia, etc. There's an expectation there that people, and particularly men, would carry those bags for women it's it, it's like it's like it's considered as abhorrent in some of these uh cultures like how can these men be so disrespectful to the women to expect them to carry those things yeah. and, yeah. I, think and I think it's it's it also has to do with um with with the way we perceive religion and the way we perceive the middle east cultures and and coming from a western country that was also something that that i did before coming here and i think it's something that you really only understand once you're here because in a way i think we all have this wrong stereotype that if, if a woman is veiled like in your case it's because your husband is forcing you to do it right yeah. it's or religion that is forcing you to do it because if you wanted to be free and real free you would not do it and, yeah. and when you come here and you say, no, that is BS, that is not true. You can be a free woman, super empowered, loving your life, loving everything about it, being completely free and choose to be failed because right. that is choice. And I think only sometimes only once you live here and you experience mm -hmm. it and you, you do realize that you had the completely wrong paradigm into your life. Yes. And, uh, and I find it even when I'm discussing this with my, my friends back at home, that, that it's difficult to have these conversations because it's, it's almost like I'm justifying it. And I'm yes. like, I have nothing to justify it. You know, it's like, it's an individual choice. <laughs> it's not no, a- Yes, I, I'm doing not- Because I'm in the Middle East. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And your position, actually, it's such an important one because if we go into the Middle Eastern culture expecting to see oppressed women and that we're going to empower them because we're free and we dress in a certain way, actually, this is where the biggest misunderstandings occur and the biggest clashes can occur in terms of cultural identity. Like I look at, you know, when you go into a culture knowing that the women and, and you know, the, the women are making a choice. And yes, there's going to be women who don't make a choice, but there's also some women in the UK or in Europe who are being forced to dress in a certain way. And to, you know, I, I was reading something about, you know, some of these big accountancy firms in, um, in Canary Wharf, that part of their policy is forcing women to wear high heels and to wear a skirt rather than trousers. So isn't that the same the other way around? And I think that, you know, when we realize that actually true freedom of women and particularly understanding of what that freedom is, is to, wear, is, is to have the choice of dressing one way or the other way and for people to accept that because Middle East attracts so much attention about, oh, we've got to help these poor Muslim women and these Arab women because, you know, we've got to get them to take their hijabs off and go out there and live like us. You know, we need to learn to, to, to respect the the confidence of the other people and the different expressions of confidence and of freedom. And, and, and so what you're saying, I really resonate with because I, I, I experience it because people think I'm Arab. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you, you know, that that's why at, at my gym, for example, they, um, they're having uh, ladies only sessions, for example. Yeah. And we, we have some even you know, locals, Emiratis coming and they, they're working out wearing the hijab. And they just find peace of mind in those specific sessions because they're afraid of being judged by the others if they're going to the mixed classes. Um, yeah. and, and they can just be free to be themselves and just working out the way they want to show up and the way they want. And th this is why I really love those ladies only sessions. I had a very good conversation with two of them and it's been eye opening for me. Super interesting. Yeah. Oh, I'm absolutely loving this discussion. It's just the, it's, it's just such a melting pot of experiences. Um, Victoria and Amanda, I'd like to come to you with regards to, uh, you know, Aurelie just talked about the ladies only um, gym and we've had conversations about, you know, dining in restaurants. Can you talk a little bit around um, what the travel logistics are like in the hotels, what you can and can't do, can you go to the pool, um, have you got your own sections of the hotels, etc. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, like I say, I was last out obviously a year ago. And so in the, in the hotels, obviously I stay in, in hotels that tends to just work for me. It's usual just booking.com. And then I use the Ubers or the equivalent of the Ubers to get around on, like, like Amanda said, it, it's, it's just easier because if there is a language barrier or from a safety perspective, you know, I can, I can say exactly where I want to go and I can see exactly how much the cost of it's going to be. And I know that there's that, that transparency there. So I would generally use those apps and when it comes to the hotels themselves I remember some of the first times going out there being quite apprehensive around the breakfast side of things as well kind of like okay is there going to be a separate section am I just allowed to go and use the buffet like everybody else um but yeah I mean it's there was one time I can't remember if it was the last time or the time before I stayed in quite a big chain as well I think it was like a Hilton or a Crown Plaza or something like that in Riyadh and I was told I wasn't allowed to use the pool so the pool and the kind of the sauna section anything like that was was it's not that it was even male it was just not for female if that makes sense they just hadn't catered I don't I think the whole thing we have to remember is that it's still not a huge market of female solo travelers really you know particularly western ones coming in um in and using the facilities certainly from what what I've seen in my experience is staying in different places um it tends to be a much more still male dominated and so they hadn't sectioned it off on the thinking that there was I, I, what I take it to be is there wasn't enough demand to have a separate section um or to kind of segregate in some ways but yeah I was told that I wasn't allowed to use the pool or the, the sauna area the gym area if I wanted to use it I'd have to let them know in advance uh, just so that they could you know make sure and, and all the rest of it, which I didn't bother with in, in the end anyway other places um where I've stayed in Jeddah which tends to be a little bit more open from a Saudi perspective they have segregated areas for the gym so I've always found it's been male and female um areas for the gym so I could work out in that area on, on my own and that that wasn't a problem um and the hotels to be honest have been fine I've not had an issue I mean obviously I've not traveled with anybody else I've always been on my own so there's never been any um, sort of questions around anybody obviously that, I, that I'm with I've never kind of any business that I've done within the hotel itself has obviously been in open areas in the lobbies and any kind of communal areas so but generally as well I've tended to go out to those offices and you know get a taxi and off I go and I've not had I've not really had any problems I've not had anybody issues on uh, reservation what I can and can't do anything like that apart from like I say that one that one example um beforehand thank you and Amanda have you got anything to add there uh, I mean very similar to Victoria I think just um a couple of years ago in Saudi the hotels yeah couldn't necessarily use the gym or the pool not that I often have time to do so anyway but no problems anywhere else I guess one one thing I'd like to highlight we're talking kind of about the cultures and the gift giving and things. Um, hospitality is really important. I know when, when I was in Bahrain um, a couple of years ago, uh, with a group of people, a, a senior person at the end of the meal, kind of nine, 10 o'clock at night had said, oh, I'd like, I'd like you to come back. And I can't remember what it was called, but anyway, basically to have coffee at his, in his house. And I went to the, um, the local person and said, look, I've just been invited to coffee. Um, and we were talking about a deal and things like that. And, and she said, you need to go, but just take a chaperone because it's appropriate to do so. Um, and it was it was really odd. It's not the sort of thing I would ever do with a British um, business person. If they said, oh, come back to my house and we'll, we'll have coffee and we can discuss further. I, alarm bells would ring. But culturally, this this was acceptable because this was what they would have done with a male person doing doing business. Um, and I went back to the house and I don't drink coffee, but I had to drink coffee. Lots of it, lots of other little things that came along on little dishes and things. Um, and that was for them, the way of them getting to know me as a person outside of the big group. But as I say, there was somebody else with me, which was culturally right for somebody else to be there. Um, but again, as we've said before, it is just, just making sure that you're safe respectful and what you're doing is, is culturally acceptable so uh, uh, but that was really interesting and actually we did some some great business after that but if I'd been on my own I would have definitely said no uh -huh. but because I was a group and there was somebody who could effectively be a chaperone then it was absolutely fine to go and do that so and an amazing um, kind of privilege to go into somebody's 
room and experience this amazing kind of selection of coffees and teas and things. Yeah. I, I had that as well, Amanda, um, sort of last, I think it was last year on last trip, uh, exhausting day with the same customer. 12 hours I mean I got more more than 12 hours actually because I picked picked up at nine o'clock from the hotel and we went down we went and did the visits and we were looking at some fertility products and clients were going and meeting doctors and doing all of that getting to know each other then we went to the office meeting all the other people in the office all the senior managers and the, the guy that owns the business then they insisted on taking me for lunch which was quite a late lunch by that point and then they dropped me back at the hotel and it must I, I'm not it was must have been about six o'clock by that point I was exhausted uh, but they're like look we've really like you to come this evening to the manager's again to his home with his wife um come into the family home again sort of coffee or shisha desserts all that kind of stuff and you know you do feel like it's the last thing you want to be doing but you know you have to do it it is a key part of building that relationship and that trust and I was doing that on behalf of the client who actually had kind of done a few faux pas before I'd been onboarded and started working with them and I knew I had to rebuild that relationship and regain the trust so literally like two hours later again I'm getting picked up still full from the lunch um, and absolutely then all these desserts galore and talking to the, the to the you know the, the manager and another team member and his wife and you have to do it you ha and you have to be I think that's an element of when you're traveling that flexibility in your schedule and those unexpected things and you just have to you have to go with it and you have to kind of like you say assess the situation but know that a lot of that is also on the basis of they're trying to get to know you take advantage of that time together and build that relationship and um it's it is an important aspect and the same thing on like you say teas and coffees and drinks don't refuse them because it's actually a positive thing and i i remember bringing a client into dubai and we had a three-day visit and we were going around and we'd go into these meetings and obviously the first thing they'll normally do is clear everything for you like, right let's get you a drink so you know you kind of think right this is like the fourth coffee of the day I really do I am sky high sky high with everything but the, the the client I was with oh I don't drink tea or coffee and I'm like looking I'm going no you, like you say you just have something it's it's rude like just take anything doesn't matter I can I, I won't bother and I had to keep saying to him you just need to take something it's 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 part of this you know <laughs> so well, Victoria this thing about Middle Eastern countries is this idea that business is built as a relationship. It's not like my private life and business. Like business is part of your personal life and your work is part of your personal life. So, and, and I somehow find it a bit comparable to Portugal because we always see it like that as well. So it's perfectly normal that you go for a business meeting and then half an hour later, you're all sitting at the restaurant for the next four hours talking about your families and football and whatever you want to talk about, anything apart from business and then business comes along as well. And it, it's just like this evolution of a conversation that doesn't necessarily have to happen at the desk in an office meeting room. And, and, and sometimes we kind of come from a very black and white and we're like, no, no, we need to discuss this now. <laughs> and, and then we'll have a conversation later or I'm too tired to go and um, have dinner at his place, but it is very common. And I think in all the countries that I've been, not just for uh, business, but for personal travel as well, I, I think I've never been to a Middle Eastern country in which someone on the streets hasn't approached us in one way or the other to come for coffee or tea uh, or a meal at their place because just so eager to share their culture and, and to get to know you a little bit more. I remember someone was mentioning Iran just before, and Iran is this amazing, beautiful place in which literally every single day of your time in Iran, you'll have at least two or three people inviting you over to their place because they just want to hear more from you and they want to be talking about their culture with you. And it's just it's just unique and, and very, very special to, to get that pleasure. I, I even had that in Morocco. Um, I was there for a conference. Uh, I delivered the, the, the opening keynotes and the, the first night we had like a sort of a gala dinner, but we, we had the same meal as they have for their weddings. There mm -hmm. was, I'm a foodie, I love food, but there was so much food. And I had one, one, one of my clients on my right, the other one on my left. So they were really checking and making sure I ate. <laughs> <laughs> I had so much food, so I was so full. And even after that, they invited me in their own, you know, in their own place with a bunch of a smaller group, same, I wouldn't have done that just, just by myself, but we were like four or five people. 
to build a relationship. And I think this is um, this is something you will find mostly yes in in Arabic and Latin cultures. I've noticed uh, yeah. quite a lot, which which makes it very very enjoyable. And and you don't want to be rude, so you <laughs> you have to eat something, and you you know you, you need to participate, right? Yes, and actually, what's interesting is that when the food uh, comes, I remember initially, me and my colleagues we'd gone on a we'd gone on a trade mission, so we ate the starters thinking that was the meal. So we yes. were full, and then the main meal came <laughs> because the starter is just so yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so you have to pace yourself. But you know the other thing is, um, just based on listening to yourselves. One of the things that's quite common is for people to have business meetings that go into the very early hours of the morning. So people ringing you at 10 o'clock and saying, oh, let's meet up. And as Victoria said, it's rude not to. And also whilst you're there, it kind of takes its own momentum. So you have to be prepared to put in for sort of like some very long days and early hour meetings and and to be prepared to be asked all sorts of questions because you know even pe people say constantly you know businesses business is done between people it's not the contracts it's person to person so you know the you know the saying that you know more business is done over a game of golf well this is a different culture's game of golf it's sitting it's mixing it's talking it's to see whether they can trust you whether there's an alignment because you know, whatever you write on a piece of paper, it's always open to sort of misunderstandings or certain things where things need clarifying. It's the person that then resolves it. So if you don't get on with that person, and I think that there's something that, you know, as, as British people particularly, but, you know, also other cultures which may be very reserved where they won't take a cup of tea or they won't take a coffee. That's like saying, I'm shutting off to you. So, so one of the things they could say is, look, I'm detoxing. Have you got water instead or something which accepts the generosity of the other person so it doesn't look like you're shutting them off and you're only there for, for for doing the deal and one thing before I forget is that when you go to the gulf one of the big things that you'll find is that if you go to uh, the emirates or you go to some of the other smaller gulf countries the local population might only be 15 percent and you're left with 85 percent of every other nationality so it's not just learning the Arab cultures and the differences, but actually that you may be meeting lots of people from India, from Bangladesh, Pakistan, Philippines, Southeast Asia, and, and how you learn to interact with so many different cultures. Wonderful. Um, I know that we could probably rabbit it on all day because we're just so excited about travel and culture and food and being together. So I have to just say a massive, massive thank you to this stunning group of ladies and this fantastic panel. This has probably been my most enjoyable Zoom session in the last 12 months. Um, so um, you'll be able to, of course, find these wonderful ladies on LinkedIn. Um, so if you are heading to the region, do feel free to, to connect with them if you've got any more questions. I'm just going to um, share my screen um, just to give you some final uh, contact details um, for us. Um, so um, I know we have a lot of ladies um, on, the, on the session today. So we do have a Facebook group, which is exclusively for female business travelers, where you can ask all these weird and wonderful questions. You can join us, of course, um, via our website. You can contact us um, on the website to subscribe to our mailing list. And of course, you can find maidenvoyage.com um, on LinkedIn. This is the first of our session um, because it's been so amazing and, and fruitful. I'm, I'm very inspired to do another one um, and I'm thinking possibly China, um, but do feel free to drop me a note and uh, suggest any other regions that you would like, uh, like us to cover. Um, and without further ado, I just want to wish you um, a wonderful week ahead and uh, I hope that you've got something valuable today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.